going to dive into a sometimes difficult, confusing, and controversial subject, and that is the subject of eschatology. Now, eschatology is the fancy way of saying study of the end times. And we're also going to look at how homeschooling fits into what the Bible says about the future. And you may have never thought about that. Um, but here's my reasoning behind this. If homeschooling is biblical, and I believe it is, and if homeschooling was a vital part of one view of the end times, and if homeschooling was totally unnecessary for all the other views of the end times, well, maybe that would be a clue as to which is the correct view of the end times. Now, that's my reasoning. You'll see, we'll see if you agree with me. Probably not, but that's okay. I'm used to, I'm used to people disagreeing with me. Um, and I know that, again, this is a confusing subject. It's a difficult subject. There's a lot of disagreement out there. Now, one of the reasons that eschatology, again, which is the study of the end times, one of the reasons it's so hard is because whenever you talk to anybody about eschatology, their mind goes straight to the difficult portions of Scripture. They go right to the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation. And those are good books, but there's some hard stuff in those books. And I hope I'm not bursting any bubbles, but today I'm going to try to keep it simple. We're not going to be looking at who the Antichrist is. We're not going to be looking at who the two witnesses are in the book of Revelation. Um, you can ask me my opinion on those things later. We are going to be looking at some of the easier, more plain, and simple passages that tell us what is going to happen in our future but also some things that will happen before Christ's return. So things that are in our future, but yet before Christ comes back. So that's the focus of this talk. We're going to be looking at what is going to happen in the rest of this age that we're in now, what many people call the church age. We're going to look at what the rest of this age will be like. And, as I said, we're going to see how homeschooling fits into Bible prophecy. So first I'm going to talk about my view of the end times, and then we're going to look at how homeschooling fits into my view of the end times. Now again, I know that I'm probably not going to persuade anybody to my view in one talk. Um, and as I explain my view, you might be thinking, where in the world did this guy get these crazy ideas from? But actually, my view of the end times, even though it's not popular today, my view is basically the same as the Puritans of the 1600s, um, guys like Matthew Henry. You may have heard of the Matthew Henry commentary. Uh, Matthew Henry held to my view. Some of the Great Awakening preachers like George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, they had a view similar to mine. Don't know if you've ever heard of Isaac Watts, the hem writer. He wrote the hem Joy to the World that we sing at Christmas time. He held to my view of eschatology. Um, some of our nation's founders also held to this view. Uh, actually, in the eight, uh, 1600s, 1700s, even on into the 1800s, most American Christians held to the view that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, not all, but most. In fact, even in my denomination, which is Southern Baptists, uh, most Southern Baptists in the 1800s believe the view that I'm going to be talking about today, and very few do today. So it used to be very common. Uh, but it's not so much anymore. So what is my view? Well, in a nutshell, it's this. I believe that the world is actually going to get better and better and better in this age and not worse and worse and worse, which is totally the opposite of what most people believe. My view is that as the gospel goes forth, that will actually begin to change not just people, but actually whole nations will be changed by the gospel. My view is the belief that God's kingdom has been slowly growing since the first century and it will continue to grow until it covers the whole earth. Then, after every nation on earth has been subdued by the gospel or discipled by us Christians, then Christ will return. Now, if that sounds strange to you, don't feel bad, because the first time I heard this view, I was listening to a, uh, a lecture on American history, and this historian was talking about how this was the view that Americans used to have, 
And my first thought was, you know, that sounds nice. Too bad there's nothing in the Bible that says that. <laughs> that, was, that was my reaction when I first heard that view. Well, now that I understand a little more about the Bible, I can say that there are things in the Bible that support that view. So we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about these things. And again, I'm going to be sticking to some of the more clear, simple passages of Scripture. So instead of starting off in the book of Revelation, because you never want to start at the end of the book, we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. Now, as I go through these passages, um, I'll either be reading them from the Bible or paraphrasing them. You're welcome to follow along. I know you may not have brought a Bible to a convention like this, but uh, you might have one on your phone. Uh, so anyway, we are going to start in Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything. God owns everything because he made everything. God has authority over all things. But you know what? He actually delegated some of that authority to us. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. It says, Then God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God has all authority, but he exercises some of that authority through us humans. This is what I like to call the beginnings of the kingdom of God. A kingdom is a realm over which a king rules. God is our king, and he rules over the whole world. But he exercises some of that reign, some of that rule, through us. Now, as you look at this passage, really, you can find my view of eschatology right here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We're going to look at some things that we're going to see that are here in this verse and are found throughout the rest of Scripture. So first, you'll look at God's plan for humanity. Again, he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So this plan, God's plan for humanity, again, God's kingdom, God exercising his rule and reign through us, it starts with a small amount of people, just two people. But that's not the end of the story. God's plan was for the whole earth to be populated. So it starts with a couple of people, and it grows. It also starts in a small geographical location. When we get to chapter 2, which we're going to look at next, uh, or pardon me, that's actually my next talk, sorry. <laughs> but you know the story. God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So God's plan for humanity started in a small geographical location, but that's not the whole story, right? He wants this to spread all over the earth. He says for them to subdue the whole earth. Now, as we walk through history and we walk through Scripture, we see that uh, later on God is going to call out a man and his wife, and that is Abraham and Sarah, and he's going to build a nation out of them. Of course, here in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is called Abram. But in Genesis chapter 12, in verses 1 through 3, this is where the Lord speaks to Abraham. And he says to him, he says, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So as we look at this promise, there's actually some parallels to this passage and what we saw in Genesis chapter 1. First of all, God is going to build a nation. This nation, Israel, would later be called a kingdom. And again, it was dedicated to God, so we could say that this is God's kingdom. Again, it starts with a small number of people, just two people, Abraham and Sarah. But that's not the end. God was going to multiply Abraham and Sarah. In verse 2, God says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. A smaller geographical location. 
But that's not the end of the plan, is it? Verse 3 says that in you, all the families of the whole earth will be blessed. So again, you see these themes of starting with a couple people, multiplying, growing into a multitude, starting in a small geographical location, but then spreading to all the corners of the globe, to the whole earth. Now when he says in verse 3, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, I think you can make a case that what he's saying is all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And here's why I believe that, because at this time in history, if you back up, we're not going to look at these passages, but if you back up to Genesis 10 and 11, every nation was made up of a family. So all the families of the earth would be all the nations of the earth. Now, if that's not, if you don't buy my argument there, uh, we're also going to look at Genesis chapter 18. And in Genesis chapter 18, God is speaking of Abraham. In Genesis 18, verses 17 and 18, it says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide to Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So again, God's plan was to start a nation, but that's not the end of the plan. It's eventually going to go to all the nations of the earth. Now, God says here that all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. We know that God does not bless disobedience. So it's implied here that one day the nations are going to be walking in obedience. Now, most Christians wouldn't dispute that. They might have a different view of the timing of when that happens. Uh, but most Christians, I do think, believe that one day the nations are going to be blessed because they're going to be walking in obedience. Well, as you know the story, uh, Abraham himself was not going to go into the promised land, at least uh, not grow into a mighty nation. Eventually, Israel would go into captivity. They would be in Egypt. Moses would lead them out. But then as they go into the land that God had promised to Abraham, they had to fight for it. They couldn't just walk in there and take it. They had to fight for it. The man that was going to lead God's people in the invasion of their promised land was a man named Joshua. And in Joshua chapter 1, we see some instructions that God gives to Joshua before they go in and conquer the promised land. So in Joshua chapter 1, God gives some instructions to Joshua, but then he gives this promise. In verse 5, Joshua 1 verse 5, God says to Joshua, he says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. So basically he's saying, Joshua, you're going to have the victory. No one's going to be able to stand before you. Now, does that mean it was easy? No. <laughs> does that mean no, that no Israelite died? No. They had to fight. It was battle. It was war. But success was guaranteed. God says, I will give you the land. You will be victorious. And the reason he gives was not because Joshua was so special, but because God would be with Joshua. So as Israel is being settled, they were a nation that was dedicated to God. We know that they did not always obey perfectly. In fact, often they got it wrong. But believe it or not, they were most of the time a lot better than the nations around them. So what were the nations doing at this time? What were all the other nations doing? Well, they were rebelling. And that's what Psalm chapter 2 tells us. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn to Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 2, by the way, was a, uh, a psalm that was often quoted in colonial America as it relates to eschatology. Psalm chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, Why do the nations rage, and why do the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces. And cast away their cords from us. So do you see the picture? All the other kings, all the other civil governments of all the other nations, they're in rebellion. They're saying, we're not submitting to the Lord. <laughs> we're not submitting to the God of Israel. We don't want to submit to him. They're in rebellion. 
So what does God do? Well, in verse 4, it says he laughs. He's not too worried about it. So he laughs at their rebellion. But then he does this in verse 6. He says, I have sent my king on my holy hill of Mount Zion. So God the Father says, I'm going to put a king on a throne in order to deal with these rebellious nations. Now, who is this king? Well, verse 7 says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, today, or has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So who is the king? It's God's son. It's Jesus. It's Christ. He goes on to say in verse 8, again, this is God the Father speaking to God the Son. He says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession." So what the picture you see here is God is likening himself to a king whose subjects are in rebellion. And so to take care of the rebellion, what God the Father does is he places his son on the throne and basically says, son, take care of it. <laughs> son, take care of the rebellion. And so the rest of Psalm 2 gives warnings to these kings and judges. It says in verse 10, he says, Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. So God the Father is saying, My son's now in charge. You better behave. That's a paraphrase, obviously. Well, as we go through the book of Psalms, there is a psalm that is actually very important as it relates to eschatology. And we're actually not going to look at it right now. But this psalm, Psalm 110, verse 1, has been called God's favorite Bible verse. Did you know that God had a favorite Bible verse? Well, the reason this is called God's favorite Bible verse is because out of all the Old Testament verses that are quoted in the New Testament, Psalm 110, verse 1, is quoted more than any other verse. So that's why it's been called God's favorite Bible verse. And as I said, we're not going to look at it now, but we're going to look at the way the New Testament interprets it a little bit later. What, what that verse says is, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Again, we'll look into this a little deeper later on. So we've looked at the beginnings of our Bibles. We've looked at some of the Psalms. Um, if we turn to the prophets, we see similar themes happening. If you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. And again, this is not an obscure verse. This is a passage that we, at least in most churches, you hear this at Christmas time every year. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. It says this, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Does that sound familiar? Of course, we know this son is Christ. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government or authority or kingdom shall be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So you see, you have the idea of, remember Psalm chapter 2, God the Father giving the government or the authority to his son. And what was the purpose of him doing that? Was to subdue the rebellious nations. Now just as we saw in some of those other passages, it's something that happens slowly. It's progressively. It starts small. But it slowly grows. He talks about, in verse 7, that the increase of his government, the increase of his kingdom. So again, that suggests that it doesn't happen right away. It starts slowly and increases. By the way, that word increase in Hebrew, it literally means increase. <laughs> so, so it's an accurate translation. Well, as we turn now to the New Testament, again, we're going to see some very similar themes. So Matthew chapter 13 Matthew 13 talks about several parables that Jesus gave that pertain to the kingdom. Matthew 13, verses 31 through 32. 
It says, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and rest in its branches. So again, you have this concept, starting very small, a mustard seed, but slowly growing until it's the biggest plant in the garden. He goes on to say in verse 33, another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until all was leavened. So again, it starts small, but then it spreads to all the dough. All the dough ends up being leavened. When you get to the end of Matthew, we have one of my favorite passages, the Great Commission. And that's found in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Not just heaven, but on earth as well. So Christ is now ruling over the earth. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Here's my paraphrase of the Great Commission. Boys, the nation has been given, the nations have been given to me. Go get them. <laughs> you remember in Psalm chapter 2, Jesus was given the authority to subdue the rebellious nations. Now he could do that. He could complete that task all by himself. But aren't you glad that God involves us in his plan as well? So he tells his disciples, go subdue the nations. Now how do they subdue the nations? Well, they do it by discipling them. This is not conquest with a sword. This is discipling. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now there are so many parallels in this passage that I want to get into, but we're only going to look at one. Uh, Jesus is now going to lead his people into the invasion of a land. Of course, we know that land is the whole earth. You remember in the Old Testament, there was a man who was going to lead God's people in the invasion of another land. And that, of course, was Joshua. Joshua was going to lead God's people into the promised land. Well, the name Joshua in Greek is pronounced Iesus. The name Jesus in Greek is pronounced Iesus. Jesus is our Joshua. Jesus is our Joshua. And just like Joshua led an invasion, Jesus is now leading an invasion. Only there's some differences. You see, the promised land is not a small country in the Middle East. Now the promised land is the whole earth. The first Joshua used a sword of steel to conquer. We use a sword too, but it's not a sword of steel. It's the sword of the Spirit, which the Bible says is the word of God. Remember, he said, teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you. Teach them the Bible, in other words. So my view of the end times is basically this. I believe the Great Commission is going to be a success. That all the nations of the earth are going to be discipled. They're going to be Christian nations. And I believe that that's going to happen, not because we're so special. But what does he say in verse 20? He says, I will be with you even to the end of the age. Just like in Joshua, God said to Joshua, you're going to win because I'll be with you. Here Jesus is saying, you'll be a success because I am with you. And so when people ask me what my eschatology is, I tell them, I believe that the Great Commission will be fulfilled before Christ returns. And as we go through the rest of Scripture, again, um, so many passages we could look at. But if you look at Acts, for example, we see the ministry of the Apostle Paul was just this that we have been talking about. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is recounting his conversion. And in Acts 26, verses 17 and 18, he's, he's, uh, he's recounting the words that Jesus spoke to him. And this is what Jesus said to the Apostle Paul, starting in verse 17. He says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people 
as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So that's the task that Paul had, was to turn the nations from Satan to God. And again, that's our task too. So I just ask you, if the human Joshua was able to complete his mission, will Christ and his church be able to complete theirs? And my personal answer is yes, they will. They will be successful. So now I want to look at some of those New Testament quotations of God's favorite Bible verse, which if you remember was Psalm 110, verse 1. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives a paraphrase of that psalm. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 26. Paul says, Then comes the end, when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he, Jesus, must reign until... He has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So Paul talks about the time when Christ will actually give the kingdom back to the Father. That sounds kind of strange, but he says that he will deliver the kingdom to God the Father. Why is he giving the kingdom back? Well, do you remember the reason he was given the kingdom in the first place? It was to subdue those rebellious nations. After the task is completed, the son hands the kingdom back to the father and says, Here, father, I've done what you asked me to do. The nations are now walking in obedience. It says in verse 25 that Christ must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And that may sound very strange to us. Wait, Jesus reigns until? I thought Jesus was going to reign forever. Well, yes, he is. I am glad for uh, theologians who are a lot smarter than I am, (laughs) because they say, guys like Matthew Henry and others, they say that there's three ways in which Christ is ruling. He is ruling everything as God. That way of ruling will continue forever. Jesus will never cease being God. Jesus is ruling in the hearts of his people. That aspect of his rule will never end. For all of eternity, Jesus will be ruling in the hearts of his people. But here, when he talks about giving the kingdom back, again, the rule that he's talking about was that specific rule that God gave to his son solely for the purpose of subduing the rebellious nation. So after that task is done, he gives the kingdom back. Another uh, paraphrase of Psalm 110 verse 1 is found in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. The writer of Hebrews says this, he says, But this man, talking about Christ, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. So you see the picture. Christ comes to earth. He offers one sacrifice for sins forever. And then after he ascended back into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. He is sitting on that throne at the right hand of God until when? Until his enemies are made his footstool. So again, I believe that in this age, Christ is subduing the nations. It's a slow process. It's a long process. Sometimes we have victory. Sometimes we have defeat. The kingdom is slowly growing, and after Christ's enemies are subdued, then he will leave his heavenly throne and return to earth. So that, in a nutshell, is my view of what's going to happen in this age. Again, if you don't agree with me, I didn't latch on to this view the first time I heard it. I thought it was pretty crazy. But after some more study, I obviously now believe it. That's my view of the end times, and now I want to try to answer the question, okay, so what does this have to do with homeschooling? Well, home education is actually a vital part of these prophecies being fulfilled. God's plan throughout the centuries has been 
for us to do his will in our lives, but also to teach others to do God's will. That's how the kingdom grows, through discipleship, through teaching all nations to obey God's commands. And of course, that starts with individuals. Now, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told to do God's will in a small geographical area, but they were to multiply. And the multiplying wasn't just for the sake of growing in numbers. God wanted more people on earth doing his will. So God wanted Adam and Eve to teach their children to do his will. Now, that's not explicitly stated in Scripture, but I believe it's strongly implied because who else was going to teach them? (laughs) Adam and Eve had to teach their children. When God built his nation, the nation of Israel, he wanted them to multiply as well. And, of course, he wanted them to do his will. And the method that God established to ensure this would happen throughout the ages was home education, what we call homeschooling. That very famous passage about homeschooling in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you've been in uh, at least Christian homeschool circles for very long, you've probably heard this passage. Well, this passage starts in verse 5. It says in Deuteronomy verses 5 and 6, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. In other words, love God by doing his will, doing what he told you to do. But then he says this, verse 7, You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So that's how God chose to disciple the nation of Israel, was by parents educating their children. You know what? I believe that's one of the main ways that he has chosen for us to disciple the nations is by educating our children, whatever children that God will grant to us. Now remember, the book of Deuteronomy was given to the Israelites just before they were going to go into the promised land. So Deuteronomy is what I like to call God's instructions for building a godly nation. One that wasn't in rebellion like all those other nations that we looked at. As you go through the book of Deuteronomy, you see many times God says, Obey my words and teach your children to do the same. It's not just mentioned once. It's mentioned many times over and over and over again. You do God's will and teach your children to do the same. By the way, nothing's changed in the new covenant. Parents are still the ones being told to educate their children, right? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers... Bring up your children in the training or teaching and admonition of the Lord. Now when he says to bring them up in the teaching or training or admonition of the Lord, it means in the Lord's will. In other words, teach your children to do God's will. Why? Well, because that's how the kingdom grows. Now just as a side note, this this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but I think it's an important one. Um, In Matthew 13... Those parables of the kingdom. You have one parable that talked about the the growth of the size of the kingdom. Remember, it started as a small mustard seed, but it grew into a big tree. But the other parable he told was about a woman who takes some some leaven or some yeast, and she mixes it in with some dough. And I believe that that parable is talking about not the growth of the size of the kingdom, but what I like to call the growth in the saturation of the kingdom. In other words, how much the kingdom of God saturates our lives and our society, that that will grow over time as well. You see, God's will doesn't just have to do with our quiet time and our going to church. It does apply to that, obviously, but God has a will concerning law, fashion, music, business, health, Economics, courtroom procedure, charity, you name it. Every other area of life. God has a will for all of these things. And we must work and pray that God's will be done in all these areas. Now this affects our view of curriculum, doesn't it? If home education is one of the main ways through which the kingdom grows, 
and saturates every area of life, then our curriculum needs to reflect that as well. We need to have curriculum that applies to every area of life. And again, that's rooted in what the Bible says about every area of life. And so home education is not just about teaching your children what they need to know to pass the SATs or whatever test they use now. The main point of home education is to teach them to do the will of God. And so often we think, I don't mean we in this room, but we as Christians, we think, well, there's some parts of life that God really doesn't have any, any opinion on. I've heard even some good preachers, even preachers that I really like, I've heard them say things like, Jesus never told us to change culture. I'm thinking, really? What about the Great Commission? Jesus said to teach all the nations to observe everything that he has commanded. If you understand that Jesus is God, and therefore any command of God is a command of Jesus, then obeying the Great Commission will lead to changing cultures. God's word contains commands that deal with every area of life. And as more and more people in a given society start obeying those commands, well, it's going to have an effect on culture. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's our number one priority. You know, we want to see people saved and go to heaven. But the gospel doesn't just change people's hearts. It does change people's hearts. And when that happens, it's going to change their views on certain aspects of culture. I think Christians from a long time ago understood this a little better than modern Christians do today. Well, as we bring this to a close, um, I know you probably have more questions now about eschatology than you did when you got here. Uh, but I hope I gave you some things to think about. In other views of eschatology, homeschooling isn't vital. And what I mean by that is those other views can come to pass without homeschooling. Now, I'm not saying that people with other views don't homeschool. In fact, I, most of the people that I know that do homeschool have a view that's different than mine. But what I am saying is those views aren't dependent on people teaching their children. Whereas my view, the view that sees victory in this age, homeschooling is an important part of bringing to pass those Bible prophecies that talk about the growth of the kingdom. One of the main ways that God uses to disciple whole nations is by parents teaching their children in their homes. Now again, I mentioned that in early America, a lot of people held to these views as well. And as you, as you look at early America, you see that most of them had this view of eschatology. It was the most popular at that time. Now, not everybody held to this, this view, but most did. Not only that, but home education was the most prevalent form of education at the time of America's founding. Again, there were other forms, but the most prevalent was home education. So, in my opinion, if you have the correct view of the end times and you have a correct view of education, those are some of the things that made America great. Now, those weren't the only things, of course, but I believe that they were a factor. So, do you want to restore America? Believe what they believed back then and do what they did back then. And then maybe by God's grace, if he wills, maybe one day our nation will be a, a discipled nation once again. So, thank you for your attention, and thank you that no Rotten Tomatoes were thrown at me for me giving you a different view of the end times. Um, we do have time for questions, um, and if you want, I can turn the microphone off. I would just mention that I have written a book on this subject, not about how homeschooling relates to the end times, but I have written a book on the end times. Uh, we just looked at a few passages. I've actually got several more in the book. I'm with uh, Fifth Kingdom Ministries, and I do have a booth out there, so you are welcome to look at that as well.